Yes. Welcome, Deepanka. Namaste, all the way from India. How are you? Hi, guys, and welcome back again for another fun session. Uh, if it's not fun, it's not worth doing. But even with the fun, we like to have some hard training as well. So today, I, I'm, as usual, we do a little bit of a warm up. But today, what I'm going to do is uh, also do a little bit of the uh, cards. We don't have time for the whole deck. It just If I do the whole deck, it just takes up too much time. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways you can use the deck and manipulate them to uh, you still get a good workout. And sometimes you can make the workout really hard or a little bit easier, even when you do the full deck. But also uh, when you're not sure about uh, time, you can uh, always cut the deck down a little bit and finish the rest of the deck later. That's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, I think today, Wuss, Frederick, good to see you. Gaza, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming along. Uh, so anyway, I think what we'll do is, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of ways we can use the deck of cards. Kenneth from Melbourne, Wuss, good to see you, buddy. Uh, we're gonna use, I'm showing you how you use the uh, deck of cards in a couple of different ways. Um, Today what I'm going to do is I'm going to do just a third of the deck or so. So there's like 54 cards, so that's 18 cards uh, for a third of the deck. But you can load them. Rochelle, good to see you, all the way from Canada. Daniel Langworthy, Graham Levy from Sydney. Oh, it's nice to have you, Graham. It's always nice to see your name pop up. Uh, so today we don't look – when we were doing the smaller deck, we had more time to do it as part of our – training session but now if we do the full deck it just takes up too much time we don't get a time, enough time to work on technique and all these sessions i like to plan around the the concept of shingi tai so we do a little bit of uh, hard physical training we do a little bit of technical training and we do a little bit of mental training okay so what i'm going to do today is rather than do the full deck i'm, I'm going to peel off a third of the deck but and it, you can join in if you want i hope you do it'll probably take 10 minutes or so, I don't know, um, maybe less. If you're young and fit, you should be able to smash them out pretty quick. But I'm just going to, I just count off one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 cards. So what we're going to do is just one third of the deck. Okay, who's going to join in? Us, Raj Kumar, Mike Clark, us, good to see you. Thanks for coming in all the way from uh, Tasmania via Perth or Perth via Tasmania. Um, Raj, all the way from Nepal, good to see you. So we've got a third of the deck, okay, and let me know. I leave a message there on the uh, live feed if you're going to join in with me because it'll probably be less than 10 minutes or around 10 minutes, and it, take, it makes up a, good, a really good portion of the physical training of that Shingi Tai that we always do, okay. Gi, the technique, okay, waza. What we're going to do today for the technique is I'm going to focus on uh, mawashi uke, okay, mawashi uke, and particularly a couple of different ways to look at it. Us, Harry, from down the mountain, good to see you. Daniel's in. I knew you'd be in. Daniel wouldn't miss a deck of cards. Um, so I'm going to focus on the mawashi uke, and I want to show you a couple of different ways to interpret the mawashi uke. Okay, this is a, the Mashi Uke, which we all know if you've done any training. And very interestingly, Soulside put in the Mashi Uke as part of the warm up exercises. We'll work that one out. It's probably one of the most challenging movements for a beginner, for a raw beginner. Of course, everything's easy once you get it. Us, Frederick's in, beautiful. Roger, good to see you, man. Thanks for coming along. Hope you got your sweats on because we're doing a third of the deck today. Just a third. All right. And I just want to make sure everybody's involved and I'll show you what I've done with the deck too. Okay. So Mawashi Uke is technically difficult to learn, but once you get it, it becomes a very central part of your training. And also it becomes easy. And like everything, you wonder why you couldn't do it at first. Okay. So I'm good. But I think it's also put it in for a very good reason. Uh, in the warm-up exercises, and I don't know. He, I never really. Oh, it's Richard, good to see you, man. 
And uh, yes, Mike's in, beautiful. Okay, so the, the uh, reason I think it's also put in the Moshe UK, and I'm only speculating because I have to say he never said this to me, but the reason it makes sense to me in my dojo is that by doing the Moashi Uke from the first day that you come in as part of the warm-up, by the time you need it, which is probably around uh, Greenbelt or so, by the time you need it, you already understand it. So you are not, you don't have two left hands trying to work out what to do, you know, uh, when you need to know it for your kata, okay? But by putting it in the warm-up exercises, you sort that right out straight away, okay? So we're going to run through the... Uh, Mawashi Uke and us, Alan, Alan Lloyd, good to see you. Now, um, I think I want to also, if we have time, it's always the same run out of time. I talk too much. But uh, I want to show a few different interesting ways to approach it, a few different in interesting ways to train it, and also uh, compare it more. Kyogushin is all about, remember we talk about the large circle and point that Saul Sai was always adamant about, and particularly this area here, which from my understanding is not covered in Okinawan Mawashiuke, but in Kyokushin, it's very, very important to cover that, that sort of movement there because when things are coming at you and you don't know what's happening, the first thing you've got to do is get the hands up and deal with that initial explosive crazy, frenetic, violent um, attack on you, okay? Um, so I just want to look at um, perhaps a little bit of that. I could be wrong, but it's what I um, have been looking at and thinking about. And also we can compare the two. Uh, Mawashi Uke, actually, you see it in tournaments a lot if you know what to look for, and you see it in a real jisen or a real street fight situation also if you know what to look for. Okay, so, uh, and I want to work out um, uh, different ways to look at that. I think it'll be a, a bit of fun, okay. Um, also, maybe some solo drills if we have time. I want to show you a few more solo drills using a kick shield as a human body, particularly when you go to the ground because one of the important things which I think over the next, I mean, I started getting into the grappling and wrestling Many years ago, 93, 04, 04, 04, maybe 25 years ago, I started to take a strong interest in it enough to go away and uh, spend days at a time uh, in places like Los Angeles training with really, really good grapplers and so on. And uh, another interesting thing was in 1994, there's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor in Victoria down at Torquay. His name's Pete DeBean. And he brought out the head of the World Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Association. His name was Carlos Gracie Jr., really nice guy. He brought with him a, a young 19-year-old named Marcio Feitosa and another guy named Roberto Correa. Everyone calls him Gordo. Okay. Now, between Gordo and uh, Marcio Feitosa, they ended up winning something like 12 or 13 world championships. So they ended up being some pretty... Um, seriously talented hard training students of of robert of uh carlos gracie jr now i ended up looking after the um brisbane the queensland sector of that tour and so carlos gracie jr and his students came and stayed with me around at my house and uh you know sitting there eating toast with cream cheese on it watching these guys in the kitchen arguing over who could choke each other out was a education in itself okay so, anyway, Mike Clark's already corrected me once. You know, Okinawan Goju Mawashi covers Jodan, Chudan, and Gedan. I'm sure it does. Um, well, it's Chrissy. He's got to head off to the boat. Well, with Kirsty and the kids, hi. Chrissy's my nephew that everyone thinks we look alike, which we do. He's the younger version of me, and he's the better kicker of the two of us as well. Okay, have a good day, guys. See ya. Bye, Maeve. Bye, Estelle. Bye, Freddie. Okay, so well, let's get going. We'll have a bit of a warm-up. And then I'm going to do one third of the deck. No chickening out because I've loaded the deck and this is what you can do. I'm only doing one third. So look what I've done. Every fourth card through the whole deck, but particularly the, the first one, is a burpee. Okay. 
But what I've done is I've loaded all the really hard burpees in the first third. So I've got the king, the queen, the jack, the ace, and the ten. So king, queen, jack, ten, ace. That's, uh, what's that, 36, 46? That's 56 burpees that we're going to do. So you guys who have said you're going to join in, you're committed now. But we'll do that, and I'm going to join in with you. So let's get going with a warm-up. Make sure you can see what's going on here. How's that? Yeah, you can see that. Good. Okay. So, ideally, here's another good thing too. If you just want 20 minutes, have a bit of a stretch and a good um, workout without committing time, too much time, take the full Kyokushin workout that Soulside designed because it works every joint, including the toes. The bottom of the heels, giving them the bottom of the feet. The, the workout that Soulside developed stretches all the tendons and ligaments in the bottom of the feet, the back of the legs, the front of the legs, the side of the body, the front and back of the body, the neck, the arms, the wrists, everything. Okay, so that 20 minute Kyokushin workout, if you do it fully, is just a fantastic workout. But we don't have time to do it now, so that's why I cut it short every time. Okay, it's me, son, she. Go, Hunter, itch, me, son, she, go, Scotty, itch, me, son, she, me, me, son, she, son, me, son, she. Hips around, itch, 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 me, son, she, Hunter, itch, me, son, she. Double shoulder width. For some of you, that might be really narrow. For me, I've just got such wide shoulders. <laughs> oh, we infatuate that way. Okay, let's twist. Hitch, knee, tuck, chip, look, look, hitch, touch, chip, and do. Down the middle, hitch, knee, tuck, knee, knee, tuck, tuck, knee, tuck, chip, knee. So I pull the right. And left. While you're doing that too, you can remember if you do just want to have a light workout, use the warm warm up, but extend it. So it means when you're doing stretches like this in the warm up, take a little bit longer, spread out those stretches because flexibility is literally time in effort. Okay, so. The longer you can stay in certain positions, the more effect it'll have beneficially over time. So if you've got a little bit more time, you want to have a workout, just do the Kyokushin stretch, man. The warm-up exercises are so good. Okay, bend the right leg now. Nice and relaxed. Remember, let gravity do the work. Mowed the lawns today, so you've got that really nice, fresh chlorophyll scent of the cut grass. Always nice. And around, toes up. Put the calf muscles down. Remember, don't hug your leg. Come on the inside of the leg and look. Use my arm to open the leg. And if you feel, if you're not quite flexible, 
in the lower back. You can use that to anchor on your leg if you feel like you're falling backwards. Anchor your arm on your leg to allow yourself to pull forward again. Cross over, knee. See, so you remember when you do this in the uh, Kogashi warm up, you do it quite quickly because, as I said, that the primary purpose of the warm up is to loosen the joints, not just the muscles. Okay? And for some reason these days, a lot of people tend to overlook the joints. I know when I was doing football work with a lot of the professional footy teams, they actually don't like the idea of flexible joints. They equate flexible joints with weak joints, which is completely not the case. I'm guessing they know what they're talking about to a degree. Well, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I think they're not completely stupid. It's just a time thing with them. They don't have enough time to allocate to the amount of stretching they should be doing. I think that's funny. If they spent more time stretching, they'd spend less time in rehab. But anyway, push your hips forward. People don't realise the primary purpose of warming up, uh, stretching, is to avoid injury. Flexibility avoids injury. The greater the range of motion, the less chance you have of injuring yourself within that range of motion. Stretch forward, pull the back elbow back so you get a nice hip flexor stretch. That feels good too. And around. If you're spending a lot of time on the computer, I don't mean watching things, I mean doing things like working on your computer. I've got a great app that's on my computer called Time Out. And what it is, you can program it. And so what mine does is, uh, well, I change it. I vary it from time to time depending on how much heavy duty. Right now I'm doing a really big translation job. It's going to take me a whole month. So I'm really intense on it. So I've set it up that every 30 minutes it gives me six minutes off. So that what I do, and you can just ignore it. You can override it if you want, but that's not the point. So what, I'm, what I've done is I've gotten used to Every half an hour for six minutes, I'll get up, I'll go for a little bit of a stretch, have a bit of a stretch in the, the house, and just move my body around in ways that you wouldn't normally do it. Okay? She got out. Feet in a little bit, and nice deep stretch. Left shoulder pushing in, stretch the spine nice and long. As you get older, one of the primary areas you need to keep flexible and supple is your spine. You look at people who aren't particularly flexible as they get older, they've got a very stiff spine. They walk with a stiff spine. If you can keep your spine supple, supple you'll always be nice and, nice and youthful in your body. That was a mouthful. Okay, both arms down. Side to side. And Shiko Bumi. So much stretch. Straight, arms forward, baggage, knee, sun, 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 One side, 
Just won't spend too much time on it. This is the sort of thing you should be doing your own time for 15, 20 minutes a day. Use one of the 15 minute card blocks if you want. I have a 15, expect I've got four 15 minute card block stretches. Front. Sitting back. And different people have different levels of flexibility, remember? And your own flexibility will change with time if you spend time on it. So you just go to your own limit, then take it a few percent more. Remember, optimal improvement comes when you take your body just outside its comfort zone. So never stay within the comfort zone. That's what I love about the deck of cards. When you train by yourself, it's very easy to fall into the trap of um, manipulating and controlling the way the energy goes. Sometimes it's good to do that, but when you use a deck of cards, shuffle them up and go, then that little bit of control is taken away from you and it forces you psychologically, physically to uh, push yourself that little bit harder. To the right, hitch. Remember the, the acronym GRAB, G-R-A-B, GRAB a stretch. So your gaze has to be correct. Don't want to stretch this way and look that way, you'll pull a muscle. R is relaxation, so you relax into it. And that's intimately connected with your breathing. A is alignment, so have the ankle aligned. Don't have the ankle in here, try and stretch, you'll pull something. Okay, have all the correct alignment in the stretch that you're doing, and B is for breathing. So you coordinate your breathing, what I like to breathe in, and as you breathe out, just relax into it. And then when I breathe in, what I do is I, I pull myself down a little more when I breathe in, so that when I breathe out, I relax down into it again. Left side, once again, same thing. even after all that talk about injury, got a real tight hammy because in 1984 at the Nationals, I terribly tore my hamstring so terribly, uh, but I didn't want to let anyone know. Um, and it was just a mess. And ever since that day, when it, when I get a little bit fatigued, it um, hurts a bit. Okay, breathing in. Breathing out. And coming forward. Okay, the first thing, here's, the, here's the, a nice hierarchy. I talk about in my new book, I talk about hierarchies of dominance, which is a phrase that I've taken from probably from anthropological studies and things like that. I know it's a common phrase within certain areas of science, but I use it a lot in martial arts too. And for me, a hierarchy of dominance is just knowing the correct order that you should do things in, that becomes a, a hierarchical uh, process. Okay, so certain things you should do first. Well, with this one, when you're stretching, if you don't have a good stretch, and right now I'm really hurting all over, but um, the first goal in this is to get your hands on the ground. Actually, the first goal is to get the sacrum off the mat, okay? For some people, they're still stuck back here with the sacrum on the mat. Okay, so if you have to, one good way to sort that out is you get a belt and you tie it to a post or a corner of the bed. Corner of the bed doesn't work so well if it's a light bed, but you, you tie it so that you can pull and you get the sacrum off the mat. So the first thing you do is you get the sacrum off the mat so that you're sitting on your hip bone. So the sacrum has one point, the hip bone has two. You want to be sitting forward on the hip bone, the two points of the hip bone. And that's your first priority. And it means sometimes what you do is you take your hands and you put them behind and you push yourself forward, see, like that. And that allows you to stay forward on the hip bone rather than the sacrum, the bottom of the spine. Okay? 
Then your next step, and this is a whole hierarchy. I'll take you all the way through it to the very, even though I can't do it myself physically, I'll talk you through it. The next step is to get the hands on the mat forward and your back nice and straight. In all of these, you want to get your back as straight as possible. Okay. The next step, once you get your hands here, your continuing ongoing goal then is to get the elbows on the ground. Once you get the elbows on the ground, then you get the forehead, the forehead on the ground. Okay? Salsa taught me this. Once you get the forehead on the ground, then the aim is to get the nose on the ground. Okay? So forehead first, then the nose. Then after the nose, your objective is to get the chin on the ground. So if you're nice and flexible, you get the chin on the ground. Then once you get the chin on the ground, your next objective in that hierarchy is to get your chest on the ground. Once you get your chest on the ground, then the last level that you aim for is to get your navel, get your belly button on the ground. Okay? So that's a really brilliant uh, hierarchy that you can use to improve your stretching, flexibility and stretching. Get off the sacrum first. You can do that by pushing back. You get up on the, the hip bone. Once you're off the hip on the hip bone, the hands come to the front. Once they're on the hands are on front, the elbows go to the ground. Once the elbows are on the ground, the forehead, the forehead goes to the mat. Once the forehead's on the mat, then the nose. Then after the nose, the chin. After the chin, the chest. And after the chest the navel, the belly button. As you get older, that belly on the, on the ground seems to get a little bit easier, okay? But that's your good hierarchy. Remember, that's worth writing down because as you get more flexible, you've always got something more and more to aim for. Give your legs a little bit of a stretch off there. That's another good solo drill we can use. Remember we do the, uh, the what I call the safe stand-up? Well, you're coming in, and you might remember we talk about the leg pendulum. Okay, well, I wanted to introduce, if you may have already heard it um, in one of the earlier sessions, but I want you to also work on the idea that sometimes the leg pendulum, the high leg pendulum is not possible when someone's assailing you. Okay, when I'm here and someone's trying to get in top, on top of me and I want to get up, well, I'm knocking down the leg pendulum up. Because my leg pins are muffed, I'll grab my leg and I won't be able to do it. So what you do is you cut that off. And that gives you the same effect. Okay, so cut it all, come up, and that's how you get up, no hands. All right? But there's a good drill where you can come from here like this. Legs go to the side. Legs go to the side. Legs go to the side. Good hip loosener. Legs go to the side like that. Okay, and then you can go one, two, three, push up, back, two, three, push up like that too. So you can use that as a little drill as well. Arms forward. With your shoulders. Neck. Important point that Solsai used to make a highlight of all the time, when you when you do the warm-up with him in uh, at Hombu, he'd watch you like a hawk. The two things he was really adamant about, the first thing was when you do the neck exercises, your eyes are open. Don't close your eyes and do it with your eyes open, closed, okay? First thing is your eyes are open. The next thing is your eyes are fixed on a single point. So even as your head goes up and down, you're looking straight ahead like an, an imaginary opponent. And then even when you go left or right, your eyes stay ahead. Even when you circle around, your eyes don't go around with you. Your eyes look straight ahead. And at first I used to think that kind of could almost limit your range of motion, but then I realised as I get older and I've gotten so much neck injury over the years uh, from um, wrestling injuries and so on, that by keeping your eyes forward, it actually protects your neck a little bit. 
because if you close your eyes and just go, well, then you can overdo the neck, especially when you take the neck back. Okay, but by keeping your eyes open and straight ahead, it actually helps to protect your neck. You'll get a good stretch in your neck, but you won't overdo it. Okay, let's go. We've got one third of the deck today, so it's only going to take about 10 minutes or so, but it's a tough part. It's a tough third. It's the toughest third because I've, I've shuffled the deck. I don't know what else is in there, but every fourth card I put a big burpee. Okay, so let's do it. <laughs> First card, kings, hearts, so 13 burpees. Yes. Ready? Only a third today. Shit. Go. But it's a tough third. Go. Pitch. Touch. Kill. Nice and steady. Kill. Everyone has their own rhythm. My rhythm's a little bit slower than everyone else's. Nick. Sun. How you doing? It's only one third. Next one. Jack. Clubs. If you want, you can keep going with the deck afterwards, which is what I'm going to do. Itch. Hey, son, she, lob, look, hitch, hutch, kill, kill, hitch. Next one. Seven diamonds. Seven sit ups. Hitch, hey, son, she, look, look, hitch, hutch, hook, one too many. Getting carried away. Three diamonds. Pitch. Pitch. Some. Next one. Queen of hearts. So, yep, yeah, we've got all the big queens. Remember, no hands getting up. Use the pendulum kick. Then roll forward with your hips. So, 12 burpees. Pitch. Pitch. Sun, shit, go, look, touch, touch. Notice I lift my hands off between. Just to make sure I don't cheat. Go, go. Hey. Next one, Jack Diamonds. Pitch, lift, sun, shape, look, look, pitch, punch, jump, jump. Next, next one, Jack Spades, first push-up of the day, so 11 push-ups, Pitch, he, son, she, golf, hook, pitch, hutch, goop, goop, pitch, next one, Nine spades. So Jack and nine back to back. 20 push ups. We can all do that. Hitch, he, son, she, go, look, hitch, hutch, kill. Next one. I know what it is. <laughs> Jack of hearts. 11 burpees. Hitch. Hip. Sun. Hip. Go. 
Look. Hitch. Push. Come. Jump. Hitch. Nine. Get a lot of uh, a lot of sit-ups. I just shuffled them up and then put the cards in. I didn't really check. Nine sit-ups. Only done one squat and one push-up. Ready? Pitch. Knee. Song. Kick. Go. Look. Pitch. Pitch. Cue. Next one. Ah, more. Five sit-ups. Five diamonds. Pitch. Then. Song. Then. Go. Next one, finally got a squat again. Eight of clubs, remember, no hands getting up. Push forward. And eight clubs. Pitch, peg, thumb, shape, golf, look, pitch, touch. I know what it is. Ace of hearts. Ten burpees. Let's go. Hitch, rip, sun, shape. So that's a good way to do the deck. If you don't have time, you can load the deck and just do a third of the deck. You make it as hard or as easy as you want. Touch, curve. Good. And next one. Ace, spades, and push ups. For me, this is always the hardest. Uh, big push ups straight after big slurpees. Hitch, hit, hit, go, look, hitch, hutch, cool. It was 10. Good. Yeah. Ten squats. Do a lot of biggies, even in the shuffle deck. Pitch, three, sun, chi, go, rock, pitch, punch, cube, two. Next one. Queen of diamonds. Twelve sit-ups. Pitch, three, sun, chi, go, rock. Pitch, punch, kill, you, pitch, me. And lucky last, no, not yet. Ten push ups. Once again, remember to get the push ups from this position, sitting cross legged position. Rock forward, take the legs, tuck them behind. From there, if you want, you can also jump out. There. Pitch, me, some, chi, go, look. Pitch, punch, cue, do. And lucky last, you know what it is, 10 of hearts. Good one, guys. Short session, not even 10 minutes, but a good workout. Pitch, me, let's go quick. Sun, come on, she, push it, push, go. Halfway there, look. Pitch, punch, two, two, and well done. Grab a drink, come back in a minute. That's a third of the deck, but a big third. Even the shuffle cards were pretty big. Today, shout out to my buddy, Fleming Schroeder from the Yamaha Dojo in Denmark. 
Hope everyone in Denmark is safe and finding a good way to train. We have visitors from Denmark in the live stream from time to time. Us, Graham, Rudd, us, Scott is on with us. Tiger, good to see you, buddy. Us, Daniel C, good to see you. And Chrissy, he's gone off boating. Good on him. So I don't know about the rest of the world. I see California's just closing their beaches. Japan's still in a state of emergency. But in Australia, I think we did pretty well. And so we've actually started the, uh, we've started to uh, relax the uh, conditions. And I wouldn't be surprised if we'll be back in the dojo in small groups within five or six weeks, maybe even earlier. Uh, so that's a good thing. Okay, so that was a third of the deck. But out of that third, we did more than half of the burpees. So that's a really good way to do it if you've only got a short amount of time. Or if you're looking for a blast, a real short, sharp blast, then you do that. You load the deck up with the hard ones and uh, you do just the th first third or half or a quarter of the deck. Okay. Let's go do some more. I hope you did it with us, Rod. No, we're sitting there in the lounge chair and watching. Um, we were just talking about Japan's social conditions. Um, you know, Rudd, you're eligible for that uh, that 100,000 yen one-time payment too, maybe even the 300,000 yen. You should look at, you probably know about it. But even non-Japanese residents who have been living in Japan for more than three months are eligible for the, uh, the government payout. Anyway, okay, so let's keep moving on. I want to look at, first of all, the uh, storm ice you care block as used in the warm-up okay and like i said it makes sense to me if you look at it purely from the difficulty well then it doesn't make sense why would you put it in the warm-up people don't even know how to do it but if you look at it in terms of an opportunity to learn the skill without the pressure of having to do the skill 100 percent correctly well then it's a fantastic way to do it okay so hey shuto so we do eight of them. So we do eight of them here. Itch. Knee. Sun. Feet are parallel. Push it over the top of our head. To the left and get a nice big stretch. Left hand up, shape over the top, to the right. Go up to behind, over the air. Pitch down. Hutch. And there's your eight warm up. Let's just do a few more. Let's do it from Sanchin now. Sanchin. Okay, because the right foot is forward, this is a fairly, I only say fairly because I know that I don't know all the answers, but as far as my range of uh, research goes, this is a universal principle where whenever you do mawashiyuke, you always have the back hand up. So in this situation, our left Foot is back, our right foot is forward. So it means because the right foot's forward, the left hand goes up. Okay? Let me move forward. Itch. Now the right hand goes up because the left foot is forward. That's a universal principle in all kata. Remember that. If you're not sure, should I have which arm? Look at your feet. If your left foot is forward, the right hand is up. Itch. Itch. Thumb. Back now. Itch. Neat. This one strikes the groin. This one strikes the jaw. Realistically, in an application, it doesn't matter where you strike. I've used this where I've spun someone around, and this one isn't even a strike. It ends up being the cross face out of Saiha or Saifa, and that one becomes the push in the back. So 
It doesn't really uh, matter, but it does matter as well. Okay, so traditionally, itch along the centre line to the groin, along the centre line to the jaw. Right hand up, itch. And not there. Okay, now let's play with this a little bit. I want to look at it, first of all, in terms of uh, bisecting it and dissecting it. So bisecting, I want to cut it down the middle so we use one hand at a time. And it's surprising how few people really do this. I'll tip this up a bit so I don't have to step all the way. Okay, so we have the Moashiyuki. One. This top hand covers the center line. It's moving across the center line. This bottom hand moves from bottom to up. This one covers the center line again. So you notice that the top hand covers the center line, covers the center line. Bottom hand just blocks straight up and gets ready to strike. So let's just look at the top hand first. So I put this hand away and the movement is this. There, I come over, over, and I draw an arc around across the center line. The objective of the top hand is to cover the center line once, twice, twice, withdraw. My elbow is never fully extended. Remember, a straight arm is a strong arm, but a straight arm is a weak hand. Okay, so you want to have your arm a little bit bent. If you want to get a good grip, you know that to be too, because if you do judo or anything, your arms are too straight, that grip, you can't optimize the grip. So to get power in the grip, you take the grip, and then you pull your arms in a little bit. Well, it's the same with this technique. We're here, across the body, the elbow stays relatively bent and withdraws to the armpit and pushes out. One, two, three, okay? Notice one something, I should, look. I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. I, I actually went into Tensho Kata there. That's the Tensho movement. Okay, we come this way, this way, and out. If I confused you, my apologies, I confused myself. Across, across, withdraw, strike. Across, cross, withdraw, strike. Okay, now, let's look at that one harm motion now in terms of, say, tournament fighting. So we're here like this, we're in a, we're in a tournament. Watch this hand. What happens when someone throws punches at you? Even a boxer will palm it away, okay? And it'll cover the center line. When you're in a tournament, that punch comes towards you, you palm it away, okay? Palm, palm, punch, punch. Palm it away, punch. Palm it away, punch, okay? So that movement straight out of Mawashi Yuke, Mawashi Yuke in a tournament literally becomes palm it away, open up, there's his arm there, palm it away, open up, straight back in. Palm it away, palm it away, straight back in. Let's do that. So here's the double, the two arms, we take the bottom one away, we cross the center line, cross the center line again. Palm, cross the center line, cross the center line. Palm, tournament fighting. Palm it off, palm it off, punch back. One, two, punch back. We used to do a drill in my dojo. When I say used to, we will again when we get back off the uh, COVID-19. We work on the idea of a V. We actually call it diamonds, the diamond step. We have a hexagonal. We have all these marks on the dojo in the shape of a big series of, uh, of diamonds. And we're here like this. We practice this move and we step off the line. Step off the line. Practice the Maashi Uke block. And when you get the tendon reflex, when you drop the foot back, you, you power off it. I'll see if I can show you. So we're here like this. We're working on the idea of practicing with tournaments. My feet are alive, okay? When you're young, you've got spring, you should never stop. You're nice and, and relaxed. And if you want to know how well that works, in the bottom link in the description, I've put a link to uh, the website KRT. It's a, it's a YouTube channel with... Uh, Darren Stringer and Wes Jansen from uh, Holland. Wes is Dutch, but he lived in England for a long time and I'm guessing trained a lot with Darren. But Darren's one of uh, one of England's best ever Kyokushin fighters. 
and Carter performance. And they and you watch Darren move, and he fights how I would say everyone should learn how to fight, and that is with a uh, perpetual motion. Never stop. Never get set. Never allow your partner to get a target. You're moving in and out, moving off an angle, boom, all around, all the time, boom. Yeah, and you're using that explosion, and he's got beautiful kicks and everything. So I have a look at that link I said anyway. But here we are. We're here like this. And what we do to practice it, we're practicing Mawashi Yuke, but we're doing it in a tournament practical situation. So we use the one hand here. This hand comes up. See that? Look. One, two, three. Tournament fighting. One, two, three. Okay? Now we combine that with footwork. Someone's firing a bullet at you, you don't turn around and run in a straight line because I guarantee the bullet can run faster than you. But what you do is you get off the line of fire. So we're here like this. As I block away, I split. See that? Right foot goes back with my heel off the ground so you get the tendon reflex. Left foot goes forward so I get off the target. So my feet go like that, like a split. And then I use my rotational force. Remember where that comes from. Power comes from the core, the hips, speed comes from the chest, rotational speed comes from the shoulder, okay? So I'm moving, I split, I do the mawashiuke movement, and I change angles. Now, what that allow me to do, because I've used tendon reflex, tendon reflex, tendon reflex a second time. So what I do is, I'm here, one, tendon reflex a second time. Watch, one, and you can throw the counter punch straight away. You get that tendon reflex off the leg. Normally about 40% of your power comes off the legs. You get this tendon reflex, it'll add another 20%. Okay, so it's worth thinking about if you want to increase the power of your punches without doing anything else. Okay, split off, tendon reflex, flex, throw the punch. And then you can turn it into a combination. Split off, tendon reflex, wash you get in. It's up to you what you do. That's where your karate, step five of the seven steps of kumite. Step five is, uh, no, is it step six is get creative, okay? Make your own karate. My karate, we call it. Step six. Step five is a, uh, is a uh, defender counter, okay? Now, so we're doing this movement, back up, top, front arm. Back arm into in tournament fighting, moving, moving, moving. Punch comes, the imaginary punch comes. Block it off, change angles. One, two. Kick that way if you want. Or, again, block it off, change angles, step up, and kick. Okay, that's the top hand of Mawashi Uke. I find it really fascinating. I hope you do too. This is so interesting. We all get used to doing this just ever with two arms. But look what happens when you do it with one arm. One arm works just as well. This hand protects the head. This hand Top arm, uchiuke. Top arm, uchiuke. Let's look at the bottom arm now. What does the bottom arm do? Well, the bottom arm is coming from the inside out. Okay? One blocks from bottom up. One, two, hit. So, there. There. So now when I'm fighting, the punch or the kick comes in. Boom. I'm capturing it here. Look. Boom. Captured there. One of the best things you can ever do, I call it the kung fu movement, the secret kung fu movement. When you're under pressure in a real situation, you don't want to stand there with your hands down. Beside. What you do is you have your hands here going, I don't want trouble. You should have talked yourself out of it by now anyway. Okay. If you can't, if you can't talk your way out of the situation, well then, you know, something's fishy. You, you, there's a difference between self-defense and self-protection. And you need to know this because self-protection is 90% of it. Self-defense is 10%. Self-protection is everything you do before you have to use your self-defense techniques. It's your psychological. It's being environmentally aware. It's uh, observation, okay, and orientate, orient yourself, okay, and you make decisions. And Who cares if you have to walk across the road because the guys up there are just cruising for trouble? You've avoided a situation, you know. Um, and you'll hear about, I mean, I had to go to court once to defend a friend of mine. Um, I, was in, I was asked to go as a professional witness. But he was a little guy, smaller than me, and has got picked on by a big guy in a pub. 
and he pushed the guy away. It just so happens that that guy was so tall, he fell down over the top of my cousin's girlfriend, who was really short. She was about um, four foot ten. This guy was six foot five. So his head hit the ground before his hips. And normally when you fall over, your bum hits first. And the guy, in three minutes, he was dead because he ruptured an artery at the back of his neck. Beyond, they'd only ever seen four cases of it before, and all of them were whiplash injuries in car accidents. And they took my friend to court and uh, tried to charge him with murder. And then that was reduced to manslaughter. He got off that too. But the point was uh, it was the way he did it that they were saying he was a, he was a sixth dan in karate. They were trying to frame him for having palm healed him, but there was no damage. It was just a push. The point is you don't want to get into that. You're much better off walking away. You can sense something fishy. You just I'm not even going in there, you know, because he was, you know, if he got charged with murder, he would have been facing, you know, 20 years in jail or because some other guy picked on him and he defended himself with self-defense. What you have to do is defend yourself with self-protection. You see there's something fishy. You pull out of there before the proverbial hits the fan. 90% of self-defense is actually self-protection. Self-protection protection is environmental awareness. It's situational awareness. It's orientation when you walk into a place. You have to know where the exits are. Oh, and I'm going to put a note in too. I have a mate uh, in, in uh, North Carolina, I think he is. He's an Aussie from Brisbane, um, Nick Hughes. He's written a book called How to Be Your Own Bodyguard. And I think, in fact, what I've done in the past when people come to my training camps I would gift them. I would gift them a copy of his ebook, "How to Be Your Own Bodyguard" by Nick Hughes. Everyone should get that, and that will teach you about self-protection. Now the guy knows his stuff. His website says, "Well, I don't know if it still does," but he says he's yeah, a few years younger than me, but. His website says, a veteran of over 2,000 street encounters, and I know he hasn't had a street fight for 20 years, okay? So uh, some of the stories of his, um, you know, and he describes one of them in there, which he said he would never, would never tell anyone because no one would believe it except there was a police camera and a police witness. And in England, police aren't allowed to enter the fray unless there's two of them. And this one guy was sent to look into some trouble and so he could see what was going on, but because he was alone, he wasn't allowed to enter into the fray. So he witnessed the entire thing and wrote a report. And uh, yes, Frederick, I literally, I've had maybe, I don't know how many street fights I've had, plenty, but most of them have been won because I'm a fast runner, okay? <laughs> you want to win, win your street fights by a number of meters, not by a number of punches. Okay, now, Nick, in, when he was in England, he got into a situation. He, it's in the book. But to cut a long story short, he was attacked by 22 skinheads, and no one would believe this unless there wasn't a police report and it's written on the, and you can go to the police station and read it. He was attacked by 22 skinheads. By the, end of the, by the end of the affray, by the end of the thing, he'd knocked out, he'd maimed five of them. So five of them had to go to hospital for serious uh, repair. He'd knocked out another eight and the other nine, I think, ran. Like once they saw 13 of their buddies lying on the ground unconscious and broken and moaning. And this is Nick by himself. Now, even he even said, well, you know, I saw my eyes, life flash before my eyes. Didn't think it had happened, but um, it did. But then, uh, and then the police arrived because that officer had um, radioed for help. So he'd knocked out 13 guys, nine ran. But the problem was this. They didn't know what to charge the 13 with because he didn't have a mark on him. They hadn't touched him. The only thing that he had, he said, was one of the guys had come at him with a big piece of wood, a big like a club, and when he knocked that guy out, the club fell and scraped the side of his leg. He got a little bit of a red mark on his leg. But otherwise, they didn't know what to charge these guys. And it, if it wasn't for the fact that there was an old man who was a, a witness to the whole thing who um, said that it was attempted murder really because they had knives and guns and uh, knives and, and weapons so anyway there you go that's environmental awareness uh, combined with um self-defense okay so let's get back to the moshi you care very interesting stuff top hand only look there there see that boom it's like a peekaboo in boxing almost bang palm it off come back 
Switch the angle, palm it off. Switch the angle, palm it off, follow. I bring the other hand to the plate. Switch the angle, palm off, rip, and then kick. Okay, now we go to the bottom hand. The bottom hand is doing this. Look, the bottom hand is doing that. That's where this self-defense awareness thing comes in. I'm here like this. I don't want trouble. Bang! And the hands go up. I call it the Kung Fu move. The hands come up together. Don't let the hands be apart. Something will get through. It's like connecting the knee and elbow, connecting the hip and elbow. If there's a little hole, it'll get through. Okay, so the bottom hand comes up, turns, withdraws, and that's a groin strike. I've never done it like that to a groin strike, but what I have done is come in and I've gone straight up and grabbed the groin, and then I've done the move out of pin and five and a little bit of a troublemaker back in about 1987. It was 1987 because I was preparing for the World Tournament. But anyway, he's come in. I've gone boom, blocked his technique, grabbed him on the groin and done the movement out of pin and five. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Boom, bang. And I literally felt his business in my hand. But boy, oh boy, it had the right effect. Okay, so that move there, you don't have to withdraw it to get the impact. Withdraw and impact. What you can do is keep going straight up the groin and grab like that as well. Uh, obviously not for tournaments, but there, there is that as well. You've got tournaments is about here, angle, hit the chest, rip, front kick or hit the chest, rip, thigh kick, switch, bang, grab, knee, okay? But a real situation, do the same thing. You cover, look, top hand, palm it off. Straight back over the face, palm it off, straight back into the elbow, palm it off, grab, take down, palm it off, inside there, one, two, you can do that too. Bottom hand, is this harm coming up? Palm it, grab, look, if you can imagine he's throwing that punch at you, you double up, look, you wrap your arm around his arm, hand on the shoulder and bang, you can dislocate the Shoulder or uh, the elbow, or if you don't, you've got control of that arm now, so you can take them to the ground. Okay, you'll see there are certain kata where you do this in the kata. Oops, hang on me. Where you push down in the kata. We even have them in um, our own kata where you come around like this. That's a perfect look. Bang, here like this. Take down, take down, take down. There, there's a perfect take down. Okay, so bottom hand coming up, bottom hand coming up in a real situation, up and palm heel to the jaw. Here, um, top hand coming down, punch or top hand coming out, palm heel to the jaw, okay, or on the weak points. Why, remember on Wednesday we were talking about the store techniques. Why do we go gamme uch, sakotu uch, kizo uch, kubi uch? Because they're all vital points. They're all weak points in the body. If you're a fan of um, The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, remember that uh, uh, Smaug, that horrible big dragon. He had that weak spot, okay? The Achilles heel is the weak spot. In Japanese, they call it Benke no Naki Dokoro. Benke was this, tr um, this uh, traditional warrior. You know, he's like the... the, the uh, anthropomorphization of the warrior power and his weak point was his shin so he got into a fight and someone was smart and got a big stick and went crack across his shins okay so um there's that as well uh there's always the weak points well you aim for the weak points the groin is a weak point for females especially when you don't usually you're physically smaller than your attacker you don't want to let that phase you you just use elbows Use knife hands, palm here, um, tetsui, on the neck, up the nose, in the throat, in the groin, on the eyes, a thumb in the eye does wonders. I'll tell you another story about that one day. Kyudo mugen, great insight. Kyudo, thanks, yeah. Kyudo mugen. If I could see the kanji, I'd probably know it better, but I think kyudo mugen probably means um, limit. Does it mean like limitless? Uh, um, knowledge or wisdom or something like that but anyway um mike's the scholar here not me okay 
But uh, look, that's that Mawashi UK is so beautiful. You've got the upper hand comes in for tournaments. The upper hand comes in for a street fight with a palm heel right on the jaw. The upper hand comes in, crack, yeah, and the Mugen I figured was, uh, you know, that means um, um, unlimited. Uh, the bottom hand, boom, comes in here. Look, bang, someone comes in and grabs, boom, you take the arm. And we did that on Wednesday. Remember we were talking about on Wednesday, we are talking about the two arm when you do Uchiuke to grab their arm off. Look, Uchiuke. I'll come down a little bit because I'm too lazy to stand up. Uchiyuke, grab the arm, drag it, remember? Well, look, exactly that. If you could imagine someone hitting you, excuse me, or grabbing you, the bottom arm comes up and then the top arm comes into play. You end up with a grab. Kokushin is big. The elbows are bent, but the movement's bigger than average. Okinawan, it's a little smaller. And then I think Okinawan is... I, I never did Okinawan, but my impression of it is it was never designed for tournament fighting. A lot of Kyokushin stuff went into tournaments in the late 60s, and a lot of guys just focus on that, which has very little to do with it uh, in reality. Is everyone getting that sound? I can't tell. Yeah, it looks like the sound's up. Is the sound up? Can everyone hear me okay? But anyway, um, uh, in Okinawan, I'm with, they have these really nice little short movements, and that there, that's just like – turns into kake uke, boom, look at that. And then you've got control of the elbow and then you've got dislocations, okay? So, boom, short movements. There, look, kake uke, kake uke, in there. Small, sharp movements, very dangerous for joint manipulation and so on. Kyle, good to see you, buddy. I didn't know you were here. Nice to see your name. Okay, kyokushin is larger, large motions because the objective here is to protect yourself your weak points, your neck, your temple, your face. Protect that with your strong outside of the arm, your armor, okay? Your armor's on the outside. Your weak points are on the inside. You've got the, uh, the, the, um, the artery right here. You've got the veins and arteries here, okay? Here, it's nice and strong, okay? So the large motion on the outside. That's what we use to protect, whereas in the smaller, the Okinawan movement, it's a small movement that allows you to manipulate the balance and control very nicely, okay? So um, that's a big difference between the two. You can you find what I love about the Okinawan style of doing it is you get that kake uke and you combine it with that principle that you know I'm always on about, that push-pull principle, okay? Whether doesn't matter which range you're at, you can find a way to apply the push-pull principle. And especially, I don't just mean hikite, okay? The hikite to me just represents the push-pull principle. It'll help you increase speed, just like when you run, like Percy Sarati said, your arms are like four legs, okay? So the quicker you move your arms, the faster your feet will go. Well, it's the same thing. The quicker you move your arm, the faster your body will move, okay? But the beauty of that kake uke movement, see that kake uke movement, is that you pull and push so you can get that combined force of push-pull every single time. And I think that's um, really, really, really uh, uh, important. And I think for anyone who's training at home in solo training, you can do that. You can kind of just use those um, movements that we were doing there before. You take your sanshin, you move, step, move, step. Move, step, move, step. And then you can turn. You turn to the side. Move, step, move, step. Again, turn again. Move, step. It depends which way you want to go. And you can play with that. And then you go, okay, let my mind go into tournament mindset. So now I'm just relaxing a little bit. And I'm thinking about in terms of my Oshiu care, which my Oshiu care in terms of tournament. Boom, so I tap it away and counter. Tap it away, counter. Un under, rip. Tap it away, counter, rip. Tap it away, counter, one, two, knee. Okay? Then I go into just send a real fight. Tap it away in the face. Tap it away, elbow. Take it away in the face. Take it away up the groin, remember. And then you combine them to go into the different ranges. So now I want to enter into the range. So I'm here, depends which side his leg is forward, of course. 
Tap it away. Come in. Boom. Take him to the ground. Finish on the ground. Tap it away, and you can do sacrifice rolls as well. Around this way to finish. The degree that you can experiment it, experiment with it is completely up to you. But it all comes off this mawashiuke. There, like that. Okay. I'm here. Boom. Here. Boom. Large motion for Kyokushin because we're thinking of protecting the head with that upper arm motion. Okay. And we protect the neck, especially. That's why we, we combine the three. Mawashiuke. Look at the arm in Mawashiuke. Arm in Mawashiuke. Arm in NK Gyakuski. Arm in NK Gyakuski. Arm in Shutomawashiuke. Shoot, look, see the arm? Shutomawashiuke is the same as Mawashiuke. You just have to uh, play with that so you can see. All right. So, anyway, um, I was going to look at some solo drills with a kick shield. Once again, we haven't got time again. Look, it was a fun day. I hope you did the workout with me. If you didn't, naughty you, but there's not much I can do about that. Okay. Um, Shingi Tai, the mind, the body, the technique and the body. And, and for Shin, that isn't just uh, learning how to develop willpower, learning how to develop fighting spirit, uh, learning how to develop courage, but it also means learning how to control your emotions. One of the great sentences that was ever uttered in the 20th century was, beware of the emotional reactions to the inevitable fluctuations of the phenomenal world. Okay, so um, the shin of Shingi Tai, the mind, is also about being able to maintain control. And that too will save you in a lot of street situations. But remember the important thing is, uh, and Kyle, see Kyle Buttress there, um, we were just talking about Nick Hughes earlier. I'm sure you've met Nick. You'd know Nick, wouldn't you? I oh, know you're from down Melbourne way, aren't you? Um, yeah. You may have met Nick, though, before he went overseas. Um, but anyway, guys, uh, work on that that beautiful Mawashiuke. Play with it. Do it while you're at a traffic light in the car. Okay? Feel the connection between the hands. All right? Yep. Feel the connection between the hands. Do them large. Do them in terms of tournament. Do them one hand and into a grab, one hand into a grab and drag. Mawashiuke into a strike, Mawashiuke into a grab, the groin and a takedown from pin and five. Uh, look, there is just no um, limit to it, but you have to open your eyes. And one of the easiest ways is take that Mawashiuke and split it straight down the middle and just do one hand first. Work on the one hand, boom, different ways to do the one Use the one hand. Look, Mawashiuke, bang, around. Bottom hand, work on different ways. Work on the arm drag, remember? That arm drag we did, yes, on Wednesday. Block, inside block. Turn, kake, grab, pull. Okay, well, it's the same thing. Look, there's your arm. Small movement gives you the kake. Boom, and just bring the other hand in for the pull. So thanks very much again, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm going to do the halves of the deck now. If I don't, I'll get lazy. Um, but don't just sit there. Make sure you're doing something during this lockdown because if you don't, you'll pop out the other end worse than you were. But really, at opportunities like this, you can pop out the end even better than you are. Okay, so thanks, everyone. Us. Have a great weekend indeed, Mike. Thanks again. Uh, Daniel, uh, good on you, buddy. I appreciate you even making the time to come along. Graham, you were very quiet the whole time. I... Honestly, sometimes I guess these messages work. I can't really see them. But thanks for coming, coming, Graham. I really appreciate it. And if you're still here, that's even better. Boss Roger, good on you, folks. I really appreciate it. But listen, check out the link, the link to um, Wes Jansen and uh, Darren Stringer's website, uh, YouTube page. And also make sure you do your little bit of work every day. And also check out that link to Nick Hughes's books. I tell you, he. Uh, he has some very, very uh, high-quality um, information in that book. I think it's, for me, I make it compulsory for my instructors to read it. I make it compulsory pretty well for anyone going for showdown. They have to read that book because it's all about uh, self-protection um, as opposed to self-defense. Big difference. Thank you, everyone. Who's Frederick?
Thanks for coming all the way from Scandinavia, from Sweden. Sweden. Have a great uh, weekend, everyone. And uh, I'll be training in the morning here at nine. Um, uh, we're relaxing the lockdown eventually, so we'll, we'll start to work in pairs. Um, home pairs only brothers and sisters or brothers and brothers are allowed to work with each other but i'll see you on monday at three o'clock and please i know it takes a little bit of time for this uh feed to come up but once it's up leave some questions and comments in the in below give us a double tap join hit the notifications or hit um share and hit uh like appreciate that very much us leo all the way from Colombia. Us. Nice to see you. Colombia, what is it? What time is there? Maybe 11, 10 or 11 at night? I know Rochelle from Canada, she's up late at night for this, so she's probably gone to bed now. But um, I appreciate anybody staying up all over the world. Thanks, everyone. Us, really appreciate it very much. I hope you got something out of it. Don't forget to leave a note uh, if you did and jump on the uh, um, membership. And also, please have a look at Patreon. 2 a.m. Wow, there you go. Oh, Rachelle's still here. She hasn't gone to bed yet. Good on you. That's tough. Um, yep, so have a look at the Patreon. If you enjoy what you're getting, you think it's um, helping you, well, then by all means become part of the Patreon family. I looked through this list and there's quite a few. Well, there's a handful of um, Patreon family members and the Patreon family will get a little bit more than everyone else along the way. So um, good on you. Thanks, and we'll see you, us, and see you next training on Monday. Thanks, everyone, us.